that we want to care and share. Okay? We take it as a positive. We need to move the ASEAN, the people okay, of ASEAN, economically, politically, socially, culturally, okay, as the ASEAN. We don't want to see as a Malaysian, as a Thai, as an Indonesian. We want to come up, we want to move as a joint members of ASEAN, which is good. Okay? Uh, and also there in ASEAN there are sending and receiving countries. Okay? So both agreed that we move together as a sending and receiving countries. Let's see what happens next. Uh, so these are the positive note. note. Okay? What is the limitation of this? Okay? Is it legally binding? Okay, fine. If it is not legally binding, still there is a discussion that we want to agree. That's also positiveness. If there is no legally binding, but then the countries, they have agreed and signed, ratified some of the international instrument. There is a discussion now at the sub-regional level, which is ASEAN. It is not legally binding, but still we can move forward. Okay? National laws and policies in relation to the declaration. What happened? Why is Tambling wrong from 2007 until 2015? You see, uh, when, when it comes to the national workers, okay, there are some laws who are still problematic. There are good laws in the countries, okay, but when it comes to migrant workers, okay, sometimes what they do, they exclude certain migrant workers from the national laws and policies. Okay, very, for example, the domestic workers, okay, in a lot of ASEAN countries, I will not blame the receiving countries part here, when it comes to foreign domestic workers, or the domestic workers, a lot of ASEAN member states did not ratify the convention, okay, uh, both the CRC, uh, maybe CRC they had ratified, but when it comes to domestic workers convention, they don't want to ratify, they look at from the point there are a lot of poor, People who are underage, they work as a domestic worker. Domestic worker. That should not should not be the point not to ratify the convention. Okay. That's why, as a result, what happened? What happened? Uh, it affects actually when you start with the regional processes because you don't have the national laws and policies. Even if you have that, then there is a problem when you want to cooperate regionally. Okay. And then whole undocumented issues. I want to hear again praise undocumented issue. You need to look at it. Okay, sending and receiving countries. All the workers of migrant workers, they are recruited by recruiting agencies, appointed by the government of sending or receiving countries. When they arrive in the receiving countries, you see the work permit issue is not the owner is not the workers. Who is the owner of the work permit? Is the employer. Employer is the owner. If employer cancel the work permit, if employer did not <coughs> process the work permit, how can they be documented? So whose fault is this? Sorry. Whose fault is this? Is the employer or it could say so? What would be the the mechanism here not to be undocumented? We don't look at the root causes. No, straight away we blame the people, the workers who doesn't have the documents. And now the connotation here again is called illegal. So we need to go away with the connotation of illegal when it comes to us here. Okay? Our point as an NGO or civil society, no human being can be illegal. And being ASEAN, we are coming up together, we should not call ourselves as illegal. Let's start with that. We might not have the documentation because of that administrative procedure. Okay, now, again, uh, with a positive note, the ILO convention. Okay, certain countries, they are ratified, signed certain convention, but a lot of convention were not ratified. Okay, zero. Yes, a lot of countries ratified. Are we implementing those? Are, are we talking about it when we are talking about the Russian mechanism? Are we talking about the CRC when we are on the table? Okay. And also the Convention on Migrant Workers and their family members. So when we are developing, as our earlier speaker and the moderator already mentioned, do we take that on the table when we discuss about the ASEAN mechanism? 
And here I want to again mention, some is here. What happened within the countries, within the countries, okay, they don't have the coordination. They change the officer, there is no coordination among the ministries. When they send the official to talk as a Rastian mechanism, every time we see different people on the table talking different things, they are arguing and not on the different issues. That's another problem with the ASEAN uh, mechanism when it comes to the migrant workers' issues. Uh, okay, uh, in the ASEAN Community 2015 Improved Promotion of Migrant Workers. Okay, what we are saying that uh, uh, the uphold and implement the national laws and policies uh, with the international instrument at all levels. What's happening? For example, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, they are having a same set of law, okay, uh, with the same uh, uh, connotation in these three countries, for example, okay, they exclude, for, uh, for example, domestic workers, okay, national laws in Malaysia, Singapore and Philippines, okay, they call them as a servant, domestic servant. Still, we are having the British colonial system Okay, putting that at the national law as a servant, still like in the old days. So when, how can you implement at the national level? When you are not implementing at the national level, when it comes to the regional mechanism, that's why they could not agree it until today. Okay, and, and here again, differences between laws and policies. As I mentioned earlier, so there are differences among the countries, that's why they could not agree on that. Okay? Lack of cooperation among the countries. We have seen in the meetings, there is no cooperation among the countries. Okay, absence of standard agreement, especially like, for example, recruitment and placement. Here again, uh, I want to mention, there are other mechanisms in this region of migrant workers. You know, there is a process called Colombo process where most of the sending countries are involved. There is a process going on globally called globalization, migration development, where countries are involved. Okay? But when it comes to ASEAN, when it comes to and a lot of ASEAN member states are sending countries, they are involved in Colombo process. And all of them are involved in GFMD, Global Forum on Migration and Development. Okay? But then what happened? Okay? The competition. Competition among the countries. For example, they subsidize when they sign this bilateral agreement. Okay, we have a problem now. We are talking about ASEAN. Can we? We are having this instrument and framework, but still we are going with bilateral agreement between countries. As a result, there is a competition. Who will send the workers to those countries? We need to stop this. In order to stop this competition, we need to have a multilateral framework with standard. Otherwise, if competition grows, what happened to Vietnam? If they want to send workers to Singapore or Malaysia, they will try to send their workers with compromising the standard. Okay? As a result, us, okay, outside of ASEAN, for example, so there are ASEAN countries where they are bringing from outside, from Southeast Asia, they will also compromise. What happened? It's the people. The workers who will suffer. Okay? So these are the things we need to really consider here. Okay? And again, the power, who has the power now is the receiving countries. Okay? Who set all the, the points okay, to the condition to the sending countries. As a result, the power relationship is still in the hand of its receiving countries. That has to go away when it comes to ASEAN mechanism. Uh, okay, as I already mentioned, undocumented worker, we need to really look at it because they look at it security point of view, not as a worker point of view. They look at it from the economic point of view, not as a uh, human rights point of view. Okay. Uh, okay, there are good examples, of course, in this region to follow the international agreement here. Indonesia, for example. Philippines. Actually, Philippines has ratified most of the convention of the UN, okay, in the world, I think. Okay, but 
when it comes to migration, yes, Philippines is a good example, but as I mentioned that receiving countries put the condition, then Philippines does not have bargaining power. I would mention here that Philippines was trying to send the workers to Middle East. Okay? For example, because they could not follow the standard that, that ratified. So because the condition was put by the Middle Eastern countries. Okay, what would happen by the government here? Okay, before this slide, I want to also mention there has to be this friendly and openness. You know, if we don't have the transparency when we want to come up with this kind of instrument, okay, we don't know what is happening. You know, it's called official secret documents. Even nowadays, bilateral agreement between countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, for example, is classified as a secret document. Can you imagine? Okay, at this age, 2015, if we still classify bilateral agreement, who is we need to read the people who are migrating need to read and you are classified as a secret document. Okay? So here the transparency is comes in. We don't know what are the conditions. Okay, openly maybe we have documents <coughs> internally, but that we cannot say publicly. It has to be public documents. Okay, when they are developing this kind of instrument so that civil society, that the people, the ASEAN people can give the feedback on it. There's, there's no openness and transparency to it. So that's why what we are suggesting, there has to be meaningful engagement with openness in order to develop a standard mechanism on uh, protecting and promoting the migrant workers' rights in the region. And here, the implementation, okay? So the laws and policies at the national level, implementation is very poor, okay? And that's also mentioned we need to tackle the whole issue of corruption when it comes to migration and you know, between countries. There is a huge corruption need to tackle in this, re, uh, in this arena, okay, both at the implementation level, law and policy. Here also, again, uh, there has to be discussion on migration, how do you have the access to justice, both social, economic or legal justice for migrant workers, both ascending and receiving countries. If the migrant workers file a case in a receiving countries, when they return to Indonesia, for example, what would be the mechanism to file a complaint? Though the ASEAN mechanism is discussing about it, but what is the modality of implementation of this uh, access to justice uh, for migrant workers? <coughs> and monitoring. What is the monitoring mechanism ASEAN will have? Okay, that has to be pacified. Until now, we didn't see anything, okay, uh, on ASEAN. And before this, I also wanted to mention certain countries, discriminatory laws and policies, really need to discuss. For example, last week, have you seen some of the uh, uh, newspaper carried out that Taiwan actually abolished mandatory medical testing on migrant workers. You know, nowadays we have this mandatory medical testing, which is a serious human rights violation. And a lot of countries, I want to mention here the Thailand Human Rights Commission is here, that all the countries are human, having Human Rights Commission, they are member of uh, UN Human Rights Commission. Now, uh, all of us know that there should not be a compulsory uh, medical testing on human beings. There should be a mechanism to promote uh, this uh, medical testing as a voluntary basis for their health purpose. As a result, what happened? Mandatory. Certain countries are putting mandatory medical tests. As a result, they will not be allowed to travel. They will not be allowed to work if you are having even pregnancy. Just imagine, <laughs> if you are pregnant, you cannot move. If you are pregnant, you will be deported. Okay. So when you have these all kinds of barriers among the ASEAN member states, what will happen? How can we come up with some standard instrument in this region when you have these differences uh, between the countries? If Taiwan can take out the mandatory medical testing, why not us? If Korea can take out the mandatory medical testing, Japan can take out the mandatory testing, we are not behind from all those countries. 
we are moving forward than them. So we need to have certain kind of uh, standard, not to have this kind of violation which is classified at the international, international instrument. Okay, I finally, as a regional organization, I really request the civil society, okay, as here I also request to the government that government need to involve the civil society. It became a tokenism in the ASEAN mechanism, okay. Civil society is a tokenism, we cannot give the feedback, okay. There has to be openness, involvement of civil society, the people themselves has to be there. One thing, if, if you would really want to have a, a good standard mechanism in this region, uh, finally, uh, the government of powerful nation here, okay, receiving countries, I mean, they have to be open. They cannot hold the power uh, uh, not to discuss about the standard, okay. There are good standards, ILO standards, uh, so uh, there are uh, standards exist in the UN mechanism need to put on the table to come up with the standard ASEAN mechanism on migration to protect and promote their rights. Thank you. Harun, precise, loud, clear, and very passionate. Um, I was, my mood was uh, a little bit clouded, not least by what's happening in my country. But when I listen to these passionate speakers, I'm very inspired. Um, some points that must be highlighted. Of course, it's important to note that the exclusion of uh, the issue of undocumented workers from the agenda being discussed is very important. Now, Harun highlighted the post the expiration of 2015 Millennium Development Goals and the development of post-2015 NDG. I have to say, add to that issue, is the development of post-2015 ASEAN vision as well. So, I urge you to have some inputs into the development process of post-2015 ASEAN vision as well. Don't forget ASEAN in that regard. Thirdly, uh, and this is very important, um, the linkages between national and regional development of policies on foreign workers and workers in general. The question is, do we need to wait for a regional standard before national policies are set up? Or do we uh, do them in parallel? And, and what are our strategies in achieving that? And the fifth point is the difficulty in implementing, not just having the standard, the important issue is implementing those standards as well, of the existing uh, standards, especially uh, Herun uh, highlighted CDOR and CRC, okay? And the issue of coordination at the national level is also particularly relevant. Uh, the issue of changing of guards uh, must be highlighted. Not least, if you look around the table, uh, you know, the organizers of this particular event, their terms are coming to an end, so next year you may be facing another team as well. So, uh, we keep changing, uh, that's true. Uh, the, and the last point uh, is the role and power of the receiving countries. Herun put it very well. And now we have three receive, um, major receiving countries in ASEAN. What are to be our strategies then, Arun and colleagues here, toward them? Because they are... I, I often use this phrase when I, I feel frustrated at the ASEAN level. I, I often say, we should not be held ransom by the negative consensus power that each of us has in ASEAN. So, if they do not agree, any one of them do not, does not agree, everything collapses. What are we to do? What are our strategies in convincing them about the merits of having this kind of uh, regional standard? I won't name names, but you know who they are, the countries that have the power. I think Harun has uh, specified some of these countries as well. So those are the points that I want to reflect from Harun, very passionate call for, you know, the urgency of this matter, okay? The, the last speaker, of course, is a colleague by the name of Shafi as well. So, Shafi, are you shifting uh, seats, making presentation as well? 
Okay, very good. Sorry, we have to uh, make a uh, musical chair. So, Shafi is now. The floor is yours, Shafi. Thank Chairman and colleague, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Mohammed Shafi. I'm from the ASEAN Services Employees Trade Union. Yeah. In short, we say the uh, ASEAN. Yeah. Uh, you can see from the from the slide, it, it is a standard overall situation in the ASEAN member state rectifying the ILO standard. Some are rectifying, some are not. Some are as usual, whenever we have any conference, they will agree. After agreed, it becomes disagreed. <laughs> so this is a very normal thing for us. And as for the trade union, we have a very hard time sometimes to put a pressure to the respective government to rectify certain uh, ILO convention. Yeah. The next one uh, we can see here, out of uh, 10 countries in ASEAN, only 4 of the countries rectified ILO Convention 487. Another 6 yet to be rectified. You just imagine and see how long. It's only 4 countries has been uh, rectified this ILO Convention 487 and uh, 5 countries uh, rectified for ILO Convention 498. So when we talk about the freedom of accession and right for organize and uh, bargaining collectively and fundamental human rights. The exercise of this right is, uh, is quite important for us to progress the economy and also the social items. Uh, when workers enjoy this right uh, during, through the collective agreement, uh, then we also speak about, uh, about the safety of workers and also fair, wa fair wages and also other conditions. Uh, from this discrimination and also we talk about the productivity and also economy growth of uh, uh, economy growth. Rectifying the uh, ILO convention uh, uh, expressed by, by government and committed to implement the principle and right concern. However, while rectifying it is an important element that the real challenges lie to the effective implementation of the ILO Convention. As I mentioned earlier, when we talk about the ILO Convention, it is easy to say ILO Convention, but to rectify this becomes so difficult. So difficult. I think uh, some countries even taking for 20 to 25 years, it is still we have a problem. Uh, yeah, thanks. The CFA received complaint, we also received complaint uh, with uh, serious and also major cases in all large scale uh, like uh, dismissal, harassment, imprisonment, violence, including killing of trade union leader, uh, trade unionists. Problem that arise among among the other restriction on the establishment of organization or the right of joining them, interference by the government and other party in the functional functioning of employers and workers' organization, restriction on quality bargaining, discrimination against union member, and undue restriction on the right to strike. The International Trade Union, Conf uh, International Trade Union Confederation, ITUC, uh, which we have over two, uh, 325 affiliated from 161 countries spread out all over the continent, had published the ITUC Global Right Index. The index was published on the survey done through the questionnaire sent to all its affiliates. The ITUC Global Right Index cover violation in, 19, in 139 countries recorded from April 2013 to March 2014, in particular violation of the right of the freedom of association, the right of quality bargaining, and the right of the strike. Baru, Daru, Brunei, Darussalam, and Vietnam are not part of 139 countries recorded in the index. 
Uh, here we have some of the index numbers from Cambodia to Singapore. Uh, this is only an uh, index uh, from ASEAN. Well, we have uh, some rating from number five to number uh, number five to number three here. You can read yourself. Uh, this is only from the survey. The main uh, the, the the index particularly mentioned what the worst places in the world for the workers to work, and Cambodia is included in the list. The main reason are the Cambodian government responded with a lethal force to demonstration to express legitimate quality demand by workers paid uh, low wages exposed to precocious and hazardous workers' condition. Cambodian workers are collectively demand better working condition and also systematic exposed to unfair dismissal, intimidation, arrest and violence often leading to the serious injury and death. The trade union law complaint with the international standard has not been adopted, and the and the labor and the labor law continue to defines in offering protection to the right of the of the workers. The gap in the compliance of international standard are divided in three. That's a, number one is committed to rectify international standard. Number two is committed to adjust the national law. We directify international standard and number three law enforcement and law enforcement enforce the national laws. And uh, as, as uh, have been shown in the ASEAN publication, the rise of the non-standard employ, employment in the selected ASEAN countries, non-standard employment are on the rise in the ASEAN region. In almost all country, temporary workers, agent workers, agency agency workers, subcontracting, and other type of informal work work are expanding rapidly. Most workers in this type of employment relation are precocious workers' condition. Given the unstable employment situation and also high risk of dismissal. These workers are discouraged from joining union and are being covered by the collective bargaining. This is a new trend in our country. The, the outsourcing company getting bigger and bigger and their right has been denied by joining the trade union. This is uh, another phenomena which the trade union have to face in this region. This means that workers' form of employment do not have a necessary support to improve their work situation, thus increase employment uh, relation in further de deepen the vulnerable of workers. These conditions are significantly contributed to the downwards of the union dissent in the region. In Indonesia, for example, three. Uh, three to four million workers are organized, unionized out of 40 to 50 million workers in the formal sector. While in Malaysia, between 11 to 13 million workers is only about one million workers are unionized. With workers being vulnerable to get tapped in the working with a lack of decent, decent jobs and decent working condition, inequity gap in the region would have with been we we've been even wider and this will jeopardize the sustainability of the integration as ILO and ADB in their recent joint report recommended decent work should be in the center of any economy development in ASEAN to ensure the fulfill, fulfillment of decent work it means the required required Trade labor liberalization and labor market flexibility flexibilization in ASEAN. ASEAN member state should provide adequate social security and a wise at work for workers. In this regard, freedom of association should be grant, granted. Granted, the principle of the non-discrimination 
of all workers to join with the trade union regardless their status being at be it a migrant workers or the outsourcing workers should be granted by granted by the government. ASEAN member states should also observe the national law and uh, enabling environment environment to permit the establishment of the national sectoral trade unions where trade union could organize workers beyond the workplace and employment status. In each ASEAN members in ASEAN member state, independent tripartite bodies between social partners are also crucial to ensure the implementation of the international labour standard. At ASEAN level, we propose that the ASEAN Trade Union Advisory Council to be established to institutionalize social dialogue and facilitate consultation between trade union, the ASEAN Salon, and the ASEAN CSR Network, and the ASEAN Confederation of Employee ACE, and the existing ASEAN Business Advisory Council. Uh, this is my uh, short uh, presentation. Uh, I, I would say this, we trade union also have a great uh, fascination of uh, many articles uh, are not being implemented by the government and also giving us uh, more problem from time to time. I agree with Brother Harun earlier when he talked about the migrant workers are not allowed to be joined. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shafi. Um, I'm very heartened by the very fact that um, we did not prepare, we did not collude on our presentation. It happens to be very coherent theme. And uh, Shafi's presentation underscores what has already been presented by previous speakers. Um, the, the importance not just of ratification, but also uh, enforcement is crucial to our discussion. Um, perhaps to highlight um, the fact that under the ITUC Global Rights Index, uh, and you see uh, this presentation, I believe it's on which page is this? Page <coughs> 7. Uh, it is ironic to state that uh, Harun on one hand said uh, there is a rivalry between ASEAN member states when it comes to economic development, but for Shafi, on the ranking, there is no competition. We're on the bottom. Uh, most of us are, uh, are on the bottom, uh, four or five, and five being having no protection at all. So we perform poorly in that regard. Okay. Uh, he also mentioned the non-standard employment. I think that refers also squarely with uh, the informal sector that Kun Sun Tree uh, presented. And the, the last uh, point, I think that's very important, because when Harun said there is no transparency going on in ASEAN level at the negotiation, I think the proposal from Shafi is a very good one, which is the, the establishment of ASEAN Trade Union Advisory Council as a focal point to institutionalize engagement and coordination. Uh, perhaps at, uh, at our uh, further discussion, we should find ways and means to actually help realize that to, to happen. Uh, my own personal point is listening to uh, these speakers. I remind reminds me of the fact that migrant workers, especially in Thailand, they are engaged in the three Ds job: dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs that local people do not want to undertake. I have been part of the Safety and Hygiene Commission at the Ministry of Labour. We have a specific law on hygiene, on safety and hygiene uh, introduced a couple of years ago and I've been sitting on that board. It happens that many of the accidents and deaths in workplace fall, have fallen on the migrant workers because these are where the dangerous uh, uh, jobs uh, takes place. So it is also an important element to highlight as well because they they are in the very dangerous and dull uh, and, and dirty sector. So protection should also be given. So 
that is the presentation of our speakers. Uh, the floor is open for <coughs> comments, uh, questions. Uh, I hope to have a very interactive uh, session. We have about uh, 25 minutes before we break for lunch. So the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen, for any comments and questions. Anyone want to start? I see a hand. Can I see two more? Raymond? Another one? Yes, okay, three hands already. The lady, please. You certainly can. Thank you very much, the chair and the yes, panelists. It's very fruitful and it is very encouraging. So I'm from, I'm Noya Pisu from Thailand. I work with sex workers in Thailand, and uh, we are people undocumented occupation here. So uh, I listening to the panelists that they are, they have a lot of worries about the uh, uh, former sector and informal sector and migration issues. So, but we are under the yeah, uncovering what they are mentioning. So I am also have a worry that uh, if we call for protection of all kinds of workers in the local, each country. So I worry that the uh, government, the state members are promoting tourism to earn foreign exchange money and that would leave about 1 million point two workers in the entertainment uh, business. So we're including the migration issue and um, uh, employment with no identification that uh, however they may be the local people and the migration people. So uh, I encourage the uh, meeting to include the uh, service workers here uh, in the uh, declaration to be identified that people uh, in entertainment business, in uh, tourism authority policy in all states too. Thank you. Point taken. I'll invite a um, reflection from the speakers later. Perhaps we can have a second speaker. Uh, hi, um, hi everyone. I'm Grima from Singapore, and uh, I work I work on human rights. But I started one um, a migrant workers group, uh, and also am working on trafficking issues through a network. I, I, I thank the speakers and I thank Thailand for doing this and I think it is a very important piece of work that uh, uh, the Thai tripartite has come together to do. On the specific questions that uh, I have uh, for the speakers, I wonder, I, I, I like what everyone has presented, uh, I like what HomeNet uh, did, your whole issue of identifying everyone was very good. And then I looked at the draft agreement and I've already got questions there about the definition of a worker. How the, question, the bigger question, maybe not for now, but for the next session also, is how are we going to incorporate the definition of the worker? That's one. The second thing is, uh, thank you Asutuk, for the global index. I looked at it, Singapore is number three. And then we are behind, uh, we are ahead of Philippines and all the rest of it. So my question here is, what are the, um, the, what are the criteria that were used to arrive at global index? For example, in Singapore, we do not have minimum wages. If that is a crucial question of protection and standardization mechanism, 
then I think all these indices we have, while we are trying to use them as tools, I also think it is problematic. If that were to be taken into account, no way Singapore can be number three. Yeah? And I think that is quite important to for us to discuss. And lastly, I wonder by this declaration, the rights of workers, right? We are talking a lot about migrant workers. So I'm a little bit confused now. Are we also including citizen workers and migrant workers? Then we standardize across board, which might be better. So it's a bigger question that I am putting forth. My last comment on this is I agree with uh, Harun about the medical, uh, it's a violation. Having said that, all workers have to go for a medical uh, examination before you get the job. But I think the constant, like every half year, like in Singapore, every half year you go for an examination, that's a violation. So I, I, I think if we are trying to standardize, then we also have to look at mechanisms even for medical examinations. Thank you. Thank you, Brahma. And the third uh, comment? Thank you. Uh, my name is Hadi Rahmatul Rahman from Indonesia. Um, uh, hearing the speakers on the, especially um, uh, on the issues of the uh, standard, I mean, the, the standard in the ASEAN, and so, uh, listen to Melizel's uh, uh, presentations in the electronic standards, palm oil standard, which is in the private sectors, and compare to the standard that uh, me, uh, me uh, by the uh, uh, states in the nationals on the region or, or in the draft standards. How can we meet this uh, uh, standard or whether we can, I mean, this is for all the, the speakers, whether we can meet the standards in the middles or trying to, to go to the, in the middle uh, between these two, the highest and the lowest standard that we have. Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's also very hard to, uh, to see that the gap between the, the standards uh, for the workers, either migrants or, 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 or the, the workers with, with the citizens, uh, the gap between the countries is so high. And um, it's, it's not easy to have the common ground to have this uh, standard, except their willingness and then a um, little bit uh, um, 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 uh, it's courage when we see how the government is looking at this uh, standard, especially on the, on the worker standard. And uh, how can we have these, uh, you know, the, 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 the same or the, the, the regional standard? The gap is so long, very high. Uh, I think that's uh, for my question. Thank you. Perhaps I should invite a reflection from the street, uh, from my, my uh, colleague speakers here. Kun Noi from Thailand, a uh, question of uh, encouragement of inclusion of uh, another category, especially sex workers and entertainment uh, business um, workers into the draft agreement and also the negotiation process uh, that's well taken. From Brema, there are actually two questions, uh, identification and definition. And also she is a little bit puzzled by, by the distinction between migrant workers on one hand and workers in general on the other hand. Are we going to do something about the general rights of workers for ASEAN or specifically uh, on the migrant workers? I believe that the, the answer, is, uh, and this can be verified by Dr. Sri Papa, is on workers in general. But of course, migrant workers deserve some more specific treatment uh, because of their specific issues. Um, of course, I invite everyone to come up with their own reflection. Hadi, uh, the, the well, it's about layering of the standards. Where are we going to put ASEAN, uh, you know, uh, on par with international standards or sticking to the national standards? Uh, of course, some of these are, are non-existent because many of ASEAN member states do not currently have their own standards. They have bilateral arrangements with their neighbours, but no concrete standards, okay? Uh, or in the middle is the, the nascent. Uh, regional standard uh, to what are we going to subscribe ourselves to in terms of being our same member states. 
So perhaps uh, I can invite first uh, Melissa, your reflection on any of these issues. Well, uh, as I alluded in, to in my in my closing, uh, it can, you know, I mean, of course, the outlook is towards having a declaration on the rights of workers in general. But as it, this is an ASEAN document then you know, we might as well take the opportunity to give space for the kinds of workers that are probably unique in our region. You know, we've all talked about the rise of outsourced workers. We cannot keep blind, we cannot still be blind to that because there are just so many. I was speaking to the Secretary of Labor uh, of the Philippines and she was asking me for solutions. Because, you know, it's really a product of globalization. We cannot, and, you know, it's either we, we go head to head with globalization or we find a way to protect the worker even in such a precarious working situation. So now we're talking about making labor rights portable, you know, so that the worker is, is not, so that the rights are not tied to particular employers, so that even if the worker is in an irregular or informal or outsourced status, then he or she brings the his or her rights wherever she goes. So that's just one. The other one I want to to address is bridging the gap. Um, I, it's such a big gap. Uh, unfortunately, there's no one from the Philippine government here. But what I want, what I can share, is what the Philippines is doing now, in so far as. You know, bridging the gap. It's hard to change the law. It will take forever. What they've done instead is to change the monitoring mechanism. So, so now the government inspection mechanism is still in place, but the government has introduced the concept of social auditors. So these are the ones who are doing what the internal or third party auditors are doing instead of sanctioning. There's a stage where they work, they, they work with factories to remediate or correct the findings or non-compliances or potential violations. So, and this is to raise the compliance level. Uh, they finally, they finally face the fact that if it's just inspection, then you just drive the violations underground. You know, it's it's a cat and mouse game rather than a common aspiration to improve the works of the lives of workers. So now they have that. So, you know, it can be it can be uh, a way to to address the gap as well. If it, if the standards are too big, then maybe we can introduce some sort of you know like a mechanism, an interim mechanism, so that we all get to the minimum before we start competing for higher standards. And I have to say that uh, the Philippines is looking at that already. They at least this particular secretary is saying that she doesn't want to compete on the basis of, you know, like a race to the bottom strategy. She wants to create niche markets. If we must send out migrant workers, she wants to capture the niche market where, you know, domestic workers from the Philippines will be more highly skilled than domestic workers, for example, in Vietnam, because, uh, because we cannot keep racing to the bottom, you know, we'll all die. We'll all drive our industries to the ground. So it's a that's a projection, at least from the Philippines side. Right? First, I would like to uh, respond to Noi. Uh, I, I agree total, totally agree with her that uh, entertainment workers. Uh, have to be a part of a uh, worker movement. They have ought to be under the the category of service workers. And, and would like to say sorry that when I do the presentation and I didn't mention about entertainment workers. Uh, uh, our our friend in uh, in the sex worker movement, but. Uh, in in our country, empower that the organization that Kunoi work have a very active on this movement of 
promote and protect the right of of uh, entertainment workers. And I agree that uh, this drafting have to cover all kind of workers and also uh, entertainment workers. That, that is the, the first point that I would, would like to uh, respond. The second thing is I know that all of us are a little bit worried because uh, even the our government, our ten state, they try to finish their agreement on uh, migrant worker protection. During this five year, with uh, nearly twenty meeting, but they can we say that they didn't didn't have any success. Even the deadline is coming, but I think it's uh, our our ambitious uh, to protect not only migrant worker but all all kind of sectors of workers, and I think only this will answer the question of our Indonesian friend asked about the, the gap the uh, national standard, the gap of each state standard. I think the, the, the way that we have to do is uh, try to set the ASEAN standard, regional standard, and after that, push it to be a, how to call it, by <coughs> binding agreement. I think only this way that we can, how to say, fill the gap. If if we let each state do attend, how to say, do according to their their willing or you know, their mind, it's still very slow, and the gap will more and more between uh, sending and receiving country between rich and poor between democracy and other kind of state. So I think even it it's not easy, but it's the right direction that we have to, to go on together to set a standard of our region. Yeah, here, <coughs> just question to the health <coughs> screening. <clears throat> it would be good uh, that uh, the ASEAN, the people of ASEAN should be encouraged to go for health checkup for their own health purposes, but it has to be linked with services. I'm going for tests, but for what? So I should have this access to have health services. So if I don't have, if it is linked with, with security, if it is linked with controlling, if it is linked with deportation, then it might not help. But rather, look at it from the health perspective to have the access to create a better situation in ASEAN countries on health issues, so on. <clears throat> but then secondly, uh, on the issue of 